we're in for a very interesting time, um, as you can imagine, the old Chinese curse um, of living in interesting times. I mean, we are going to have an enormous uh, economic onslaught upon working people and their families. I don't think you've seen any of it yet, really. Um, it's going to be coming down the line, down the track, really pretty quickly. And apart from the politics, I mean, the politics of it are obviously absolutely essential. Because I don't think um, that the unions can can win this for their members on their own. I mean, there's got to be a political dimension. But I want to start off by saying that I do actually think that the question of language uh, in all of this is essential. The way in which these debates and discussions are framed uh, is actually essential uh, to pursue because. I mean, I will use the Labour Party um, <coughs> example. I mean, we speak to each other in terms of talking about going to the AGM or the GMC and the local CLP. And normal people <laughs> didn't understand what you're talking about. And there is a, a trade union speak yeah. um, that real people didn't understand. Mm -hmm. And I think we've got to be conscious about that. And I think you can see in terms of the way in which the right are approaching this, the way in which they are trying to frame the debate. Now, an early speaker mentioned Wisconsin. One of the really interesting things about what is happening in Wisconsin, apart from the substance of it, is the way in which the language is being used. I mean, there's a conscious and deliberate attempt to frame the argument about cuts there in the context of saying, of almost denying the legitimacy uh, of trade union resistance. Because what they're saying is, well, in the private sector, they need to fight for the spoils um, of capitalism between shareholders on the one hand and workers on the other. But in the public sector, um, it's a fight between those who are working in the public sector and the recipients of the service, the taxpayers, you know, with the, with the phrase in front of it, long-suffering taxpayers. Now, if it's framed in that sort of way, then clearly you've got to be in favour of the taxpayers or the service users. And the people who are behaving illegitimately against the general public interest are those who are defending their own position in the public sector. And you've started already seeing that coming across into this country. There was reports um, from, I think, the Policy Exchange just the other day, one of these right-wing think tanks, who was commenting on a speech at the RCN where somebody had said, somewhat foolishly, um, that a good health service would be one that treated its workers properly. Now, you can see what they meant. We can also see how that's distorted. And it's a question of making sure that the unions do not allow themselves to be boxed into a position where they are seen to be just simply a vested interest um, in that way. I mean, they can tell the way in which the Tories have been trying to run with this phrase, uh, we're all in it together. I mean, that is a conscious effort yeah. to phrase it all in the way that it, these, their aspirations are legitimate. And of course, you know, we can, we can respond to that with the issue with bankers and them being toffs and all the rest of it. But they are trying that approach, and it just seems to me that, that we can't allow that. Similarly, the whole question of pay, um, sorry, that was a spy, right? The, um, <laughs> the whole question of pay, making sure that we present pay as being, sorry, sorry, pensions rather, sorry, pensions as deferred pay. You know, making sure that it, we present it in the context of being something for which people have already paid, and it's their legitimate right, not just an aspiration, their legitimate right to actually receive it at the end again, is a different way of phrasing it. I also think that we need to be very careful about how we use the term public services, because there is a, a general view about things that are the public's, you know, earn mine. I mean, they're no my concern. I mean, public parks, well, that, that's no my responsibility. We start talking about essential services rather than public services. It just seems to me, again, it puts it in a different sort of context in, a, in terms of their importance to people as a whole. Because, you know, lots of people will tell you that they don't feel that the public services... Well, I mean, I've, you know, I've covered that point. I mean, I didn't want to reiterate. The, the other issue that I think that the Tories and the Liberals in particular are feeling their way on um, is the question of fairness. They are constantly trying to frame, frame lots of the things that they are doing in the content, context of fairness. Now, I mean, I think that what they are saying is nonsense. But fairness is a very, very strong and powerful concept and I think that we cannot afford to allow them to, to, to take that ground. I mean, it's, we've got to be putting forward always alternatives, perspectives and visions um, of fairness. And I think we've also got to recognise that we have, as a movement, you know, a natural tendency, uh, understandable and laudable, to want to defend the poor. But the vast majority of people do not regard themselves as poor. And quite a lot of them think, actually, it's their own fault for being poor. 
And simply saying that we are here to defend the poor, and this is going to affect the poor adversely and all the rest of it, is for a lot of people who find themselves struggling somewhat of a switch off. Because it makes the unions look as if, and the movement look as if, we're interested in somebody else and we're not interested in them. And we've got to therefore always be conscious you know, of how we do that um, to overcome this question of what I think will be an attack on, on the very legitimacy um, of what we, what we seek to achieve. I mean, I think that in terms of dealing with people outside, the question of what, what have the unions ever done for me is actually a very important one. People can often see the relevance of it at the workplace, but not necessarily in the context of wider society. And to tell people to, to mix my, um, my sketches, to say that you know, if it wasn't for the unions, you'd still be living in a cardboard box in the middle of the road, um, might be true, but people don't respond to that. Because might, while their grannies and grandfathers might have lived in a cardboard box in the middle of the road, that's not something that's facing them immediately. Yeah. And we do need to think of ways in which we can connect to them. I mean, my own constituency, we are able to, to relate to people in relation to the shipyards, for example, because people can see that the shipyards depend upon government contracts. And you know, what, what the unions are doing there um, clearly is something beyond the workplace and has to involve in political um, activity. And people can see the point of that. But very often, um, we fail to, to go beyond that, particularly when we're dealing with young people. I mean, I, I've seen the work that the STUC is doing, um, and it's laudable in terms of going into schools and talking to people about unions and stuff like that. But most young people have, have, have listened to that, and it, to some extent they don't see the relevance of it until they get into the workplace. And the number of young people who are in badly organised, bad, they're badly trained, particularly in people like host, host, uh, hospitality where they're, they're isolated and so on. It is very difficult in these circumstances to see the relevance of unions. Um, now that's which is why I think that the fourth Fair Tips campaign, for example, and the stuff on minimum wage that the unions did was excellent because that was able to connect with a group and he was seen to be picking up um, their interests in a way that uh, hasn't necessarily always been done before. I mean, the majority of this audience, unless I'm very much mistaken, uh, could be described as middle-aged or above. Now, it's not immediately... Yes, I know, I know. Not, I didn't mean you. I didn't mean you. But uh, the immediate relevance of yourselves to, to young people is not always um, as clear to them as it might be to you. And, and therefore, I mean, it does require innovative... And I think that the stuff about contacting people through Twitter and all the rest of it... We've got to watch, of course, that we really confuse uh, the means of transporting the message with the message itself. I mean, sometimes it captivated with the idea that, well, we can speak to people on Twitter. But, I mean, rubbish in, rubbish out. I mean, if you're not speaking to them in the right language, the mechanism doesn't, it, doesn't it necessarily count um, for, for all that much. The <coughs> other point I want to make is about uh, the unions being um, incestuous and deeply boring and having an overwhelming tendency to speak to each other. Themselves. Now, when the Labour Party had its leadership election recently, um, you may have noticed we spent about three months talking to ourselves. Uh, and that allowed the Tories to run away with the whole, with, with putting us on us the idea that the recession was all their fault. For about three months, we didn't do anything about any of that. Now, perish the thought that I should describe Unite as having been internally focused for the period of the General Secretaryship <laughs> election, not, since the time, not, not, not least since I'm sponsored by Unite, but you possibly recognise the, uh, the picture. I mean, there is an enormous tendency for yourselves to speak to yourselves. Now, partly because most of the people involved in unions, particularly at a higher level, shop stewards and all the rest of it, are not normal. On the basis that when you are out at meetings, normal people are out doing other things, aren't they? I mean, so going to the Labour Party on a Sunday afternoon when other people are watching the football, I mean, that's no normal either. So you've got to recognise that you're no normal. And it's therefore, it's very easy to start looking for the praise and approbation of other no normal people. You've got to always be conscious that we need to actually be reaching out much more in terms of the presentation and like of what we do. And I think that the, um, the final point, I will actually partly would just say that the, uh, when an MP normally says finally, um, it means he's about 40% through, but he wants to give his audience some hope. <laughs> <laughs> I'll actually move in towards the, uh, towards the end. I mean, I, I think that the, we've got to watch that we're not just looking for a better 1950s, you know, where the, the unions had a big position in society. I mean, I can see from my own constituency how things have changed. 
in terms of again just coming back to the yards. Shop stewards were people of stature in the local community um, because they were known, they lived in the areas where they worked, they lived beside their workmates, they were role models, they were looked up to by a whole variety of different people and that, but that to a great extent is good. It's not automatic that unions get respect. It's got to be. It's got to be worked for. But I think recognition of those issues are actually the first steps on the way to, to addressing them. Now, it seems to me that the unions ought to be, you know, much more externally focused on a on a number of issues. And let me just let me just give you one, um, and that's the question of the AD referendum. Now, I mean, my I, I don't care particularly actually one way or the other. I mean, I could live I could live with either. Um, but I think the question of making sure that crime does not pay and that the Liberals are punished for getting into bed with the Tories um, is in itself a good enough argument to say, you know, figuratively if not literally, death to the Liberals and vote, uh, vote no in the referendum. Now, I think that the union should be saying something on this, even if you don't think I'm right. The unions should be having a clear position on something like this because there are lots of your own members out there who are looking about, casting around. I mean, I'm, getting, I'm actually surprised, genuinely surprised, how many people in my own constituency have asked me what I think um, of AV because they, you know, they want to know, in a sense, um, about it. So I've put, you know, I get, get pages in the local paper, so I've put, up, uh, put slogans on it, things like, no AV, if you don't, if you don't know, vote no, uh, punish the Liberals, vote no, and then just for good measure, um, Tories bite off babies' heads. <laughs> just to remind people, just to remind people where I'm coming from, to set it, to set it in a context, you see? But the unions have got to be seen, in my view, to be going wider than just simply, you know, their industrial focus. And therefore, something like AV seems to be a classic example of where you ought to be seen to be part of civic society. And I think that's, you know, that's the final point I would want, final, final point I would want to make, honest. Um, I mean, civic society, I think, is quite a good concept in many ways. It's our concept um, that the Tories are trying to steal and distort. You are part of civic society, and you therefore have a responsibility to look wider um, than having conversations with yourselves and yourselves at the workplace. Because in the coming crisis of capitalism, or however you want to describe it, being involved industrially or at the workplace is not going to be sufficient. Oh. And if that's where you focus, you're going to get beat. Mm -hmm. that's it.